<laughs> All right. Well, let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we're so blessed to be able to gather and uh, to sing and to have this prayer list, these concerns. Uh, we're blessed to be able to study your word, and uh, we thank you, Lord, for how good you are to us. And Lord, uh, every week I'm so thankful that all over this building there are adults and teenagers and children in Bible studies, and some of them are learning music, and uh, there are others who are getting a meal tonight, and I'm thankful for those who prepare the food and clean it up. I'm thankful for all of the volunteers that work with the children and the teenagers, and for those faithful teachers working with our adults. Uh, thank you for all of these folks, what they do every week. Uh, Lord, we lay before you the names on this prayer list and the names that we've mentioned tonight and the things that are, uh, have gone unmentioned. We, uh, we commit all of these things to you and ask for your will to be done. We trust you in these things, Lord. You have shown yourself to be faithful all the time. And uh, we, we have fears. We have concerns. We have our own grief and wounds, but in all of these things, you are good, and you are faithful, and I'm thankful tonight for that. And as we open your word, we ask that you would speak to us, uh, remind us of how good you are to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, tonight we're going to be looking at Romans 8. So Romans 8 is considered one of the most profound and uplifting chapters of the entire Bible. And there are so many different layers to it, uh, themes of freedom, hope, assurance for believers, and so we're going we're gonna to look at some of this. There's too much to cover tonight, and so I know we'll, we'll, we'll go through maybe half of it tonight and do the other half next week. It may turn into three weeks. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe the Lord will return before, before long, which would be okay too. So, what we'll do tonight, I'm going to go ahead and start reading from Romans 8. I'm, I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into the first part of the chapter in depth. But let's start, let me read the text. Romans 8, starting in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because, though Christ, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. 
And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. (laughs) Sorry, I couldn't help. Verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long, for we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus 
our Lord. Woohoo! All right. Looking at the chapter as a whole, what would you say is the central theme of Romans 8? Jesus, amen. What else would you say? What's the central theme? Okay. What did you say, Rick? God loves us. That's good. So, in general, the, the thread that runs through all of it is the assurance of salvation and the security of believers through Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, there's a lot of different aspects to, to that. But uh, here, Paul appears to be teaching about the way the Holy Spirit operates in the lives of those who are in Christ. And what the Spirit does is enable the believer to live this new life. So Paul's understanding was that this wonderful new life opens up before those who put their faith in Christ. And that... You know, everything about that life depends on the work of the Spirit. Now, you and I partner with the Spirit in God's work in our lives. But all of the things that Paul describes here are things that the Spirit does because the believer is in Christ. Um, It's also interesting, and especially for Paul, Romans 8 doesn't have one command. There's not a single imperative. Paul loves to give commands, you know, do this because of, you know, there, he has a, a strong ethical sense. Because of what God has done for us in Christ, it requires us to live in cert, a certain way. But there's not a single command in chapter 8. Instead, Paul is talking about life in the Spirit, a life in which the Spirit guides, empowers, equips, transforms, And so, because of what the Spirit does, there's no need for Paul to give us a string of commandments. Uh, And it's also interesting, the chapter begins with, there is no condemnation. It ends with, there is no separation. And in between, you might say, there is no defeat for those who are in Christ. Uh, No condemnation, no separation, and no defeat. All right, so for this evening, let's look at the first part of the chapter. So look back at verse 1. According to verse 1, what is the state of those who are in Christ Jesus? All right, so there's no condemnation. He begins by uh, connecting what he says in chapter 8 with everything that comes before And so he has taken several chapters now to bring out the way that God saves us in Christ. And in light of everything that he has said up through the end of chapter 7, he begins chapter 8 by saying the conclusion is there is now no condemnation. And he uses that word now as a contrast to the life we were in before Christ. Uh, at that time, apart from Christ, there, we were condemned. But now, because of Christ, we are no longer condemned. Believers have a wonderful gift of salvation from God through Jesus Christ. What we've been saved from is condemnation. It's a legal term that includes both the sentence and the execution. Uh, for believers, not only are we not guilty, But instead of being separated from God forever, we're going to live in God's presence forever. Uh, So the news is good. So in verses 2 through 4, what does Paul tell us about the law of the spirit of life? What does it set us free from? Okay. The law of the spirit of life sets us free from the law of of sin and death. There is no condemnation because of what Christ has done by freeing us from the law that condemns us. So, 
when Paul talks about the law of the spirit of life, that word law probably has the sense of principle, the, the principle of the spirit. Uh, so here, the principle on which the Holy Spirit works is a, a principle, he's telling us that the spirit operates in power. The presence of the Spirit is the distinguishing mark of the Christian. And so the presence of the Spirit means the defeat of the power of sin. The power of God's Spirit works to defeat within us the power of sin, both now and forever. So Paul is saying that when the Holy Spirit comes into a person, that person is liberated from bondage to sin, and finds new power within, uh, the power to defeat sin, a power to live a Christ-like life, uh, to be changed, to be made new, and to live forever. You follow me? Yeah. So the Holy Spirit is the the deal breaker. Uh, The believer is freed from the law of sin and death. And the, the way that Paul writes it here, he's saying that that is a decisive act in the past. Uh, Jesus died on the cross for our sin. And when you believed in Christ, you are set free from the law of sin and death. Neither sin nor death has any, is any, has any cause to give us concern ever again. You still sin, right? But it's forgiven. Your sin is not going to keep you from the presence of God forever. Isn't that good news? Unless the Lord returns, every one of us, sooner or later, is going to die. And we have nothing to fear from the end. Because to go from here is to go into the presence of the Lord, according to Paul's understanding. Okay. Verse 3 uh, Paul is very clear that what has set us free is what God did for us through Jesus Christ. So, Paul is saying that there is something that the law of Moses simply could not do for us. And God has now done that thing for us that the law couldn't do. And He did it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why does he say that the law failed? Because we're weak. And you have to, to, be, to be careful there. Paul is not saying there's a flaw in God's Word in the Old Testament. Where is the flaw? It's right here. It's right here. And so, uh, the law is weak because my flesh is weak. And Paul doesn't say here that the flesh is evil, only that it's weak. So weak that we can't do or meet the requirements of the law. The fault is always in the weakness of our flesh. The good, the good news is that God has acted on our behalf. And so how did God condemn sin in sinful man, according to Paul? What did you say? He sent his son. Okay. So it was no remote messenger that God sent. It wasn't a prophet, but the, his own son, his only son, the son of the living God, who stood in a, new, in a unique relationship to God the Father. And he says, how does he say that God sent him to us? In the flesh, in the likeness of sinful man. I like in the flesh better. That's a better English translation. Um, uh, he's saying that... that When Jesus became flesh and blood, He accomplished what was necessary to be accomplished in order for our sin to be forgiven. And now, sin is condemned, but we are not. Isn't that good news? Yeah. He he says that God sent Jesus to be a sin offering. And so, he, uh, He condemned sin so that we would not be condemned. Right. In verse 4, he says, in order that. So Paul here talks about the divine purpose. And since that 
divine purpose never fails. It points us to the result of what God has done. So what is the result of the divine purpose? Right? He says, so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled. Look at what he says. In the full sense, only Christ has fulfilled all the law's requirements. But when we are in Christ, we, in our measure, begin to live the kind of life that God would have us to live. So Paul isn't saying that we fulfill the law's requirements, but that the requirement of the law was fulfilled in us by the Spirit because of what Jesus Christ did for us. Before we came to know Christ, we were continually defeated by sin. When we came to know Him, and when we received the indwelling of the Spirit, we're able to live a new life, a different kind of life, that we would never be able to live according to our own strength. So not only is my sin forgiven, but I'm also given the Word of God and the Spirit of God so that I can be changed. I'm not what I was before Christ. I'm constantly being changed into the likeness of Christ. When will that process be completed? Yeah, at the end of all things. So in the meantime, Paul says that I am to walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So Paul likes this metaphor, walking in the Spirit, uh, walking with the Lord. It's a kind of a congenial way of describing that steady but unspectacular progress that characterizes our walk with Christ, the whole Christian life, just walking with the Lord. Um, I'm guessing that in your walk with Christ, and some of you have been walking with Christ a long time, there were probably times where you experienced quite a bit of transformation, right? But more often than not, it was mundane and happened one day to the next over the course of a long period of time, like going on a leisurely stroll. It's not a sprint. It's a walk. And so, Paul says we don't walk according to the flesh, but we walk according to the Spirit. We keep in step with the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit dwells in us and enables us to live on a standard we could never attain to ourselves. So then, starting in verse 5, Paul makes a contrast. What's the contrast that he makes in the verse, starting in verse 5 in the verses that follow? Okay, so if it's true that I'm walking in the Spirit, Paul says, here's kind of, I can walk in the flesh, and this is what that's like, or I can walk in the Spirit, and here's what that's like. And so, he has in mind that those whose lives are dominated by the flesh are strongly opposed to the things of God. How does he say people live their lives when they are in the flesh? According to their sinful desires, their sinful nature. What else does he say? Looking down through there. Governed by the flesh. Hostile to God. Hostile to God. Can't do what God wants. Yeah, so he has several things. Those in the flesh who have their minds set on the things of the flesh are preoccupied by those things. They concentrate on those things at the exclusion of everything else. So what he's saying, you'll know these people by their fruit. Their lives will be focused on this world, their worldly concerns, their own fleshly or earthly desires. They'll be preoccupied with all of that so that the things of the Lord, 
become pushed to the side and may get dropped altogether. It's like when Jesus tells the parable of the sower and some of the, the seed falls on good soil and it takes root and it starts to grow, but the, the weeds grow up as well and choke it out. And Jesus says that's the, what does he say? It's the love of money and the cares of this world that chokes out the word of the Lord from producing fruit in people's life. And so Paul has that same kind of idea here. It's the same kind of language that Jesus used to rebuke uh, Simon Peter at Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, verse 23, where he told him, your mind, is, your mind is not set on the things of God, but on the things of men. Now, what did Simon Peter want Jesus to do? Why was he rebuked? Do you remember? Right. So they just had this, uh, uh, they, the disciples had just come back from doing the Lord's ministry, and he gathered them together, and they were reporting. And, uh, and so he asked them, well, who do people say that I am? And they gave him all these reports, and then he asked them, well, that's great. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter makes this extraordinary confession, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commends him, that's great. And then he says, now that I've told you all this, you need to know I'm on my way to Jerusalem where they're going to take me, and I'm going to be crucified. And on three days, I'll rise again. And then Peter goes to him, surely not, Lord. That's not going to happen. We're not going to let that happen to you. And so Jesus rebukes him. Your mind is not set on the things of God, but on the things of men, specifically the things of Peter. And Jesus he constantly warns us not to approach him, not to approach our king and the kingdom and the things of God through the lens of our own self-centeredness. And that's what Peter was doing. That, and that's what Paul is saying here. We have to be careful. Peter was not desperately wicked, but he was looking at things from a completely worldly point of view, from a self-centered point of view. Left to my natural devices, my default setting is to place myself at the center of the universe. What about you? And uh, what Paul is saying is that because I'm in Christ, I died to that whole kind of thinking, that whole kind of living, and the spirit within me produces a different kind of living. Praise God that the day is coming where I'll meet the Lord face to face and all of that tension between the world and the things of the spirit will be done away with. Uh, but the flesh and the things of the flesh are not to be the focus of my entire life. All right. Excuse me. What about those who live according to the Spirit? How does Paul describe these folks? Okay. Life, peace, those sorts of things. And so the people who walk in the Spirit, who live according to the Spirit, are not intermittently interested in the things of the Spirit. Uh, it's something that becomes the focus of their lives, their waking hours, their concerns, their interests. Uh, it is a delighted uh, contemplation and pursuit of what the Spirit does to pay attention to where the Spirit is moving, to participate in what the Spirit is doing, to listen to what the Spirit is saying, to act on what the Spirit is saying. And so it is the very opposite of a concentration on oneself and instead is focused on the presence of God and the advancement of God's kingdom. And so Paul says in verse 6, uh, what is the result of the mind of the flesh? Death. Literally, he says... There's no verb in the sentence. And so he says, the mind of the flesh, death. I mean, that's what you get. Uh, he's saying that to be bounded by the flesh is death itself. It is a cutting off of oneself from the life that is life indeed. And it's one of the, uh, the paradoxes of the Christian life. In order to live, we first must what? 
To win, we have to what? We have to be last. We have to lose. Uh, To gain everything, we have to what? Serve, lose everything. All right. The opposite of the mind that is death is the mind of the Spirit. And what does Paul say about the mind of the Spirit? It is life and peace. Again, the thought is of thoroughgoing concentration on the Spirit and the Word of God and the things of God. When the things of God dominate one's outlook, when one is constantly responsive, to what the Spirit says in one's life, then there is life. There is the abundant life, the eternal life that God provides. And this is the opposite of the death that concentration on the flesh brings to us. So, He also says the believer has peace as well as life. And I think this peace will mean that we enjoy that new relationship, that reconciliation with God and everything that comes with it. Uh, Only good things wait for us in the presence of God. So in verse 7, what does he say? Instead of being on good terms with the Lord, what does the sinful mind do? It's hostile and it does not submit, nor can it do so, he says. Uh, it's, not, it's not even possible, because the mind of sinful man is, is following sinful man. You know. uh, in the Old Testament, it talked about idolatry. In the New Testament, it talks about you know, our own self-centered pursuits, the pursuit of our flesh, uh, our earthly sinful desires, uh, where Jesus is not our king, but we've made ourselves king, and we follow our own desires. Um, let me see what else is, bears mentioning here. There's so much here. It's interesting, I guess, in verse 9, What's his summary about those who do not have the Spirit of God? Again, in Paul's understanding, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you are not in Christ. The Spirit uh, determines everything. So this brings, just, this brings up an interesting issue that uh, churches have dealt with since, I don't know, Paul was uh, traveling around the Roman world? How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit or not? What are your thoughts? How do you know? All right? Your life changes. Transformation. I'm not what I was. I'm not what I will be. Definitely not what I was. I think that's good. What else? How do you know? Okay. Right, you, conviction of sin, not just conscience. Uh, because Paul has already talked about in Romans 1 that our consciences can be corrupt. But we experience the conviction of sin according to the Word of God. We know, we know that we've strayed or missed the mark. And the Spirit reveals that to us. Good, what else? How do you know? When you know, I know. It's funny. Nobody said gold dust glitters around you. (laughs) Speak in tongues. Okay, so, you know, different denominations have different answers to this question. How do you know? And uh, I would caution. Some of those pursuits, I, I don't think that they're as helpful. Nor are they indicative of the Spirit's presence. They might be but they might not be. Uh, in the 70s, all across, it started in Canada and then, uh, and then swept across America, the Toronto Blessing. You remember that? And the Pentecostals would, the, the holy laughter, they'd roll on the floors laughing as a sign of the Spirit's present, presence. Well, I don't know anything about that. I'm, I don't know if that's real or not. 
what I do know is that in Galatians, Paul tells us what the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. You know, because love, joy, patience, all of those things. That's how you know. As Jesse said, transformation. Those are the things, the fruit of the Spirit becomes evident in our lives over the course of our lives, you know. That's how you know. Uh, and the more we hear the Spirit talking to us, the more we respond, the more the Spirit we receive. The more we yield up our lives, the more of the Spirit speaks to us, and we hear, and we can follow. So the Holy Spirit is the, the, the deal breaker. The presence of the Spirit will be with all who believe. Um, so in verses 12 through 17, what is the relationship between believers and God? Okay, so in those verses, what's the relationship between the believer and God? All right, so Christ lives in us, and as a result of that, we become children of God. We are adopted in to the family. Yeah, and we're not just the ugly stepchild. We are joint heirs with Christ. Now, Probably what that means is, is that well, we are a beloved part of the family. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be sitting on the throne at the end, of, you know. Right. It just means, uh, Paul wants me to know uh, I'm a co-heir. I'm not, a, I don't live in the servant's quarters. I live in the father's house with the rest of the family. You follow me? I mean, I, it has that kind of idea. And then, he says something interesting uh, in verse 13. Let me look, make sure that I get this right. He says, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So isn't that interesting? So what do we have to do in order to live? Have the Spirit of God in us, and what does the Spirit help us to do then? Yeah. To put to death the misdeeds of the body. Or does anybody else have a different word than misdeeds? Yeah, if you live according to the flesh. The, the misdeeds of the body. So Paul has in mind, again, we partner with the Spirit to die to our old sinful way of living and to live in this new life in Christ. Uh, I don't put that, the old man, to death. But the Spirit comes in and produces new life. And as a result, that old life dies. And so I, I also have the responsibility to walk in the Spirit and not in my flesh. And so if I'm going to walk with Christ, I can't pursue all of my old you know, self-centered interests at the same time. I let those things go in order to, uh, to walk with Christ. Yes. I, my wanter becomes fixed so that I want to want, I don't just want to want the right thing, I actually want the right thing. Okay. Let's see. And He says after we do this, what happens to us? You put to death the misdeeds of the body, what will happen? You live. Real life. According to the Spirit, the abundant life of Jesus Christ, the very life of God Himself. Yeah. Amen. And so he talks about sonship and adoption and that we are co-heirs with God. All right. We could noodle around in all of this stuff for a long time. Let me just give you two things, according to verses 1 through 17, for you to just keep in mind. First of all, uh, the Holy Spirit is the key to the Christian life. Uh, the Spirit makes that life possible. 
Uh, the Spirit provides the very life and presence of Christ Himself within us. And so the Spirit brings blessing to the believer uh, with justification. The Spirit makes it possible for us to hear and understand the Word of God, to know how it applies to our lives. The Spirit helps us to obey the Word of God. The Spirit uh, comforts us with the presence of God. The Spirit helps us to experience peace because of God's presence. And one day, the very Spirit within us, I believe Paul says, is going to raise us to new life. Just like God raised Jesus to new life. Um, the old covenant, Paul says, couldn't do any of that. The Spirit now makes it all possible for us because of what Jesus did. Everything depends on the Spirit. Secondly, Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and the Holy Spirit's residence in believers gives us unparalleled spiritual intimacy with God as our Father. Not just that we are no longer God's enemies, but we are His beloved children. And Paul says now we can go before God even with the cries of Abba, Daddy, you know, very intimate. Very personal. Um, God loves all people. That's true. But make it personal. God loves you. He wanted you. He desires you. He calls your name. He has a place just for you. He dwells within you. It's very personal. And uh, I hope that you will get a sense of that um, as you walk with the Lord. Sometimes the Christian life is pretty uh, eventful and exciting, and some days just one day upon the next upon the next. But in all of that, we have intimacy with God the Father because of the Spirit's presence in our lives. Questions tonight on on what we looked at through down through verse seventeen. Comments. All right. Well, next week we'll get into further in the chapter. We'll see how far we get. And uh, you can tell me all about predestination, all of those kinds of things. All right. This Sunday is Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday this year, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And so I hope if you're able to be here Sunday morning in both services, we will observe the Lord's Supper together. And uh, that's a very special time in the, the life of every believer, especially this time of year as we approach Good Friday and then the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Um, okay, let me pray for us. We'll be done. Lord, we want to thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. We want to thank you that you give us your spirit, your presence who lives within us. And we ask, Lord, that every day you would help us to walk with the spirit and all the different things that that means for us day in and day out. Help us to walk in and with the spirit. And Lord, we want to thank you, not just for the forgiveness of our sin, but for that intimacy we have with you now because our sin is forgiven that we can live in your presence, that we can walk with you, that we will be with you now and forever. We thank you that we can call you Father, Abba, that you love us, and that you wanted us to know how much you love us. So Lord, I pray that you would stir it within us, the presence of your Spirit, so we would be awakened, you anew every day. May your will be done in the lives of those here tonight and the lives of those who are watching online. I pray that you would bless them, provide what they need, watch over them, and encourage them by your presence and give them peace. We love you, Lord. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.